Welcome to the Radiology Review Podcast, your on-the-go source for radiology education with your host, Dr. Matt Covington, a board-certified radiologist. Please follow the podcast on Twitter at RadRevPodcast. Send emails to theradiologyreview at gmail.com or visit the website theradiologyreview.com. Let's talk briefly about calcifications. Amorphous calcifications, I already gave you some information on. Amorphous calcifications in general may be okay if they are scattered, especially okay if they are layering on the lateral view. But if these are segmental and new and grouped, that's bad, and you should just biopsy them by RADS4. Coarse heterogeneous calcifications are also by RADS4 and need to be biopsied. Fine pleomorphic, fine linear, and fine linear branching calcifications are always concerning a need biopsy. In general, if the core exam gives you information that calcifications are any of these terms, fine pleomorphic, fine linear, or fine linear branching, I would make them a BIRADS4. I would also assume that this will end up being a cancer, most likely DCIS, but potentially something invasive. You need to biopsy those. In terms of all calcifications, you really need to know what they look like. The BIRADS Atlas is a great source of imaging that shows great examples of how these should look. Remember on the core exam that they do not have mammography diagnostic quality monitors, and so if they show you calcifications, they will have to be very obvious on the image. They can't show you very subtle calcifications because the monitors just aren't good enough. In terms of calcifications, some of them are typically benign, some of them are suspicious. Typically benign calcifications are skin calcifications, vascular calcifications, coarse or popcorn-like calcifications, and if you see something or are given the term popcorn-like, the first thing that should come to mind is a degenerated fibroadenoma. You can see large rod-like calcifications, that's a buzzword for secretory calcifications. Remember that secretory calcifications typically develop in women 15 to 20 years after menopause, so in general women should be in their late 60s, 70s, 80s. If you see large rod-like calcifications in a 30 or 40 year old, you need to be concerned that these are not secretory calcifications but are actually ductal carcinoma in situ. Secretory calcifications are also typically bilateral and diffuse. Other typically benign calcifications are round calcifications. Rim calcifications are a manifestation typically of a calcified oil cyst. A calcified oil cyst is also Another way of saying that this is fat necrosis. In that setting, you typically would have some sort of history of prior breast surgery or trauma, and the sequelae of that trauma is fat necrosis, and an imaging manifestation that confirms that is rim calcification with a lucent fat-containing center. Dystrophic calcifications are typically benign. Milk of calcium, again, typically benign. I've spent some time talking about that, because it is such a common question and important concept in mammography that I would expect to get some questions on milk of calcium. Remember, it's benign, BIRADS2. And sutural calcifications, those are more an entity of the past. The surgeons aren't using sutures very much anymore in their surgery, but just be aware, look at an image of how that looks. Doubtful that you have seen that in practice to this point if you have your lucky and more prepared for the exam. Calcifications that are suspicious based on morphology are really four. Amorphous, coarse heterogeneous, fine pleomorphic, fine linear or fine linear branching. Please don't get confused that amorphous is associated with milk of calcium. I am talking here amorphous calcifications on both views. Okay, these calcifications are smudgy and do not change between CC, MLO, or full lateral views, suspicious, biopsy, coarse heterogeneous calcifications. Note that that is different from coarse or popcorn-like. If you see the term coarse heterogeneous, that is concerning they are BIRADS4 lesion, you need to biopsy them. Fine pleomorphic and fine linear or fine linear branching calcifications need to be biopsied. If they ask you a question on which morphology of calcifications are most likely to be cancer, the answer is fine linear or fine linear branching. That makes sense because fine linear or fine linear branching is basically our description of calcifications within the ductal system of the breast. Imagine if the branching ducts in the breast are calcified internally, 
you will see a fine linear branching pattern that is highly suspicious for cancer. Distribution also comes into play with calcifications. Diffuse distribution means that these are scattered throughout the breast. Typically, they would be bilateral. Commonly, you will see diffuse round bilateral calcifications. Those should be benign. Regional calcifications are a smaller area than diffuse. Generally, it's about two centimeters of size of calcifications. These are also typically benign. Grouped calcifications, our suspicion starts to increase. Byrads specifically uses the term grouped. Sometimes in practice, you may hear clustered. Some breast imagers use the term grouped more to denote that the calcifications are benign and clustered, more to denote that there is some suspicion. The core exam will not get into that. I would try to remember that the pure term from Byrads is grouped calcifications. Linear is more concerning. I don't think I need to tell you that linear calcifications mean the calcifications are forming a line, but I just did, so there you go. I think of segmental calcifications as a triangular distribution with the pointy tip pointing towards the nipple. This is another way of calcifications telling us that this is an inductal distribution because the ductal system is most narrow at the nipple and then branches out towards the chest wall. So you can imagine if that calcified, you will see a lot of linear fine branching calcifications and they will converge towards the nipple in a segmental distribution. A few other quick concepts in terms of calcifications. Skin calcifications tend to be rounded and they often will have a lucent center. Sutural calcifications tend to be oval shape or kind of roundish, like you are tying a suture and it calcifies. You may see the linear portion peripherally and the central knot. Milk of calcium, again, is amorphous on craniocaudal view and layers on the medial lateral, lateral medial, or medial lateral oblique views. You may also distinctly see a cyst and see the calcification layering at the bottom of the cyst and see a change in configuration between views. I would know that for milk of calcium, a way to bring out the layering is to perform a magnification lateral view with extended hold and what that means is you place the women in compression and have them stay there for longer than you would on a normal mammogram sometimes a minute or two and then image and that gives the calcification time to layer down into the cystic areas and form that milk of calcium that you see i would know that milk of calcium is related to fibrocystic disease because what it really is is the liquid calcium layering in a cyst. The interesting thing with secretory calcifications is that the descriptors are many things that are typically suspicious, things like linear, branching, segmental. The reason why is that, like cancer, secretory calcifications are actually calcifications that form in the ductal system of the breast, so you will see linear branching patterns and a segmental distribution. The difference is the appearance. These are coarse, rod-like. Sometimes the term may be cigar-like calcifications. They are bilateral, and they form in women about 15 to 20 years after menopause. Now let's transition to masses. Remember that margins are key for management of masses. If the margin is obscured, make sure to get an ultrasound to see it better. Highly suspicious margins are spiculated, indistinct, and microlobulated. If the margin is well circumscribed, that is typically a benign feature or a probably benign feature. Commonly circumscribed masses are fibroadenomas or cysts. However, I would be aware that triple negative cancers also present as very circumscribed masses. On ultrasound, benign characteristics of a mass are circumscribed, wider than tall, anechoic, with posterior acoustic enhancement. Concerning findings on ultrasound are anti-parallel orientation, where the mass may be taller than it is wide, irregular shape, indistinct margins, shadowing, angular margins, echogenic halo, which suggests that there may be irritation and edema around the lesion, and any speculation on ultrasound. Let's talk about the rule of multiplicity, sometimes called Sickles rule. And what this tells us is that on a baseline mammogram, you can give a BIRADS2 assessment in the following situation. If there are at least three benign appearing masses, two of which must be in one breast and one in the other. Let me say that again. At least three benign appearing masses, you have to have at least two of these in one breast and one in the other. 
If any of these are palpable, you should perform ultrasound to confirm that they are cysts. If any of these masses are an outlier in terms of being significantly more dense, substantially larger, or if any of the margins look suspicious, you should work it up. But if they all generally look similar, benign, bilateral, circumscribed, low density, these are a BIRADS-2 finding. In general, you should know that benign cysts tend to wax and wane over time. So if you see bilateral circumscribed waxing and waning masses, that's also a pretty safe bet for BIRADS-2. On the core exam, if any lesion has concerning margins or other concerning findings, you definitely should work it up. Remember, on the core exam, the imaging manifestations will be obvious, so if they are trying to show you a suspicious mass on a sea of other benign masses, the suspicious mass will be quite obvious. Standardized tests really enjoy asking questions on multifocal versus multicentric cancers. I would expect some questions on this because it is just too easy to ask. Multicentric lesions are lesions in different quadrants of the breast. Multifocal lesions are lesions in the same quadrant. To me, the word focal means that they would be closer in proximity, okay? They are more focal to each other. They are in the same quadrant of the breast. That's at least how I can remember this. Remember, multicentric, different quadrants, multifocal, same quadrant. In general, the idea is that multicentric lesions may require a mastectomy. That's what the core exam probably would want you to say. In real life, it's substantially more complicated because technically you can have two lesions that are just on the edges of each quadrant approaching each other, and the distance between them could be very little, but technically they would be in different quadrants. Technically, that's multicentric. In reality, those patients wouldn't get a mastectomy. On the core exam, however, they will show you something that has maybe a mass in the upper outer quadrant and another mass far away in the upper inner or lower inner quadrant, it will be clear there's some distance between these. You would say multicentric, and if they ask a follow-up question on appropriate treatment, you might select mastectomy if that's an option. On the other hand, multifocal lesions and multiple lesions that are very close to each other typically can be treated with lumpectomy or breast conservation therapy. What's the difference between a lumpectomy and a breast conserving therapy? I used to, as a resident, think these were essentially the same thing, but they're not. Lumpectomy simply refers to the surgery where you have removed the lump and spared the rest of the normal tissue in the breast. Breast conservation therapy incorporate lumpectomy, but it also means you may have had chemotherapy, hormonal therapy, and or radiation, so it's the combination of everything that makes it breast conservation therapy. Content of this podcast is provided for informal educational purposes only for radiology trainees and radiologists. Medical practitioners, please make your own independent assessment before suggesting a diagnosis or recommending any course of treatment. This podcast should not be used for self-diagnosis or self-treatment and is not a substitute for independent professional medical care. Please consult your own physician regarding any diagnosis, imaging interpretation, or course of treatment.